Welcome to our third video on the free and open source default game engine. In this video, we are implementing an enemy with a basic behavior of walking forward until colliding with a wall and then flipping into the opposite direction. We will add animations to the enemy and to the player that was implemented in the previous video. Since some people required more detail on scripting with Lua, we will be going slowly over the implementation of the enemy script with the default scripting language, Lua. Let's keep building our default game. To explore other ways to create our game, let's create our enemy through a different route. Let's create a collection. Right click on the main folder and choose the add new option and then choose the new collection option. In the dialog box, name it enemy skeleton. Next. Let's go to the Game Resources folder and look for the Skeleton Sprites folder. Right-click on it and choose the option New Atlas. Name it Enemy Skeleton 2. The Atlas window will open and the right pane outline will now hold the root node for the Atlas. Right-click on it and choose the option Add Animation Group. In the ID field, name it Attack. Right-click in the Animation Group and choose the option Add Images. In the new dialog box, choose the sprites associated with the enemy attack with the option Shift-Click. If you are following the tutorial with the same set of sprites as us, then be careful to choose the files where each frame of animation is in one different file. The skeleton enemy animation strip has different sizes that make it difficult for default to get them right. When done, close the window. The new sprites will be displayed in the outline pane, and in the central window, press the key F or drag the view around to find the sprites imported. You can preview the animations by pressing the space key. In the current animation, we have forgotten to set the frame rate to 12 and to make sure that the playback mode for the animation is forward once. Repeat the action for all the animations that you want to import. In our case, we will do it for hit, idle, and walk, in fast forward mode. Once done, go to the Enemy Skeleton Collection window and in the Outline pane, right-click on the Collection node. Choose the option Add Game Object. Rename it to Enemy Skeleton. Right-click on the game object and from the menu choose the option Add Component, and then Sprite. Below in the pane, in the Image field, click on the three-dotted button, and from the new dialog box, choose the Enemy Skeleton Atlas. As default animation, select Idle. In the central window, press F to find the object or drag the canvas around by dragging the mouse around while pressing the middle button mouse. If you press the spacebar, you can preview the default animation for the enemy. Right-click again on the enemy skeleton game object on the outline pane, and choose the option Add Component, and then Collision Group. Right-click on the Collision component and choose the Add Shape option, 
which will allow you to add the shape of the collider to be used by the box 2D physics engine used by default. In our case, we are going to use a square. Adjust the size and position of the collision box using the transformation tools in the editor top left corner. Choose the collision root object. And in the inspector, under type choose, kinematic and name the component to collision skeleton. Right click again on the enemy skeleton game object and add a new component collision. Next, add a box shape. Move it around to be more or less in the place where the axis for the skeleton will hit the ground when performing the attack animation. We will use it as a hitbox, so, let's rename it to hitbox. Change the type to trigger. In the group let's define it to be in the enemy layer, and in the mask to interact with the player. Let's go to the main collection, where we are building our level. For now, we only have our player and the mini level sandbox that we have created in the previous video. Let's add in the enemy. For that, in the outline right pane, right click on the root node called collection, and from the pop-up menu choose the option add from collection. In the new window, you can see listed the enemy skeleton that we have created. Choose it and close the window. In the outline, we can see now, the enemy skeleton listed, but it is nowhere to be seen. Click on the central window and press the key F to center the viewport around the enemy. Drag it into the level near the player. Let's run the game. We can see our player and our enemy, and of course, our enemy is not doing anything else the playing its default idle animation, and quite fast as we didn't adjust the frames per second for the idle. Let's make it now. Close the play window. And go open or select the enemy skeleton atlas. Let's check all animations configurations to make sure that they are all set at 12 frames per second, and that they are set depending on the case, to be looping or not. Before starting coding the enemy behavior, let's close the level limits or our enemy will be moving out of the level several times. For that, we need to put walls in the limits of the worlds and have them identified in the game as walls to allow us to change the behavior of the enemy when touching walls. We need to open the cast tileset source that we created in the previous video and define a new collision group, in a similar way that we did for the ground. So, in the outline right pane, right click on the tile source item, and from the pop-up menu choose the option Add Collision Group. In the ID field, rename it to Walls.
Now, in the tile set in the central window, with the walls object selected, click on the tiles that you want to be associated with the walls group. In our case, we are choosing three wood elements. You can see that as you click on them, they are highlighted to reflect that they have been selected. Now, let's go back to the main collection, and choose the game object associated with the level. You can see that it has already a collision component that is associated with the ground. We need another one to hold the wall's collisions. For that, right-click on the root game object for the level, and select the option Add Component, and then Collision Object. Rename the new collision component to Walls. In the group field type in walls and in the mask, type in enemy and player, as the walls will block both enemies and player. Now, double click on the tile map element of the level, and it will open the castle tile map. Press space to open the tile set palette and choose the walls, and paint the walls at the limits of the level. Go back to the main collection, and before running the game let's set the collision type for the walls collider to static, as we don't want the level to fall under the weight of gravity. Now, let's create the script for the enemy. From the left hierarchy pane, let's open up the enemy folder and right click on it. Select the option new, and then script. In the pop-up dialog box, in the name type skeleton script, or any other name that could suit best your particular case. Click the button Create, and Default will create the script for you and populate it with the function's prototypes. Let's start by declaring some variables at the script level. A local move acceleration initialized with 100, that represents the acceleration of the enemy when moving. A local max speed set to 50, that is the maximum speed at which the object will be able to move through the level. A local gravity set to minus 1000. Two local boolean variables to hold if the enemy is colliding with the ground and the walls. Both are initially set to false. Since Default's architecture is based on messages being passed between the different elements and components in the game engine, to be able to refer to them correctly, you need to have the reference ID of each of the elements. To avoid accessing using the full path each time, you can define and store a hash table to the main elements that will allow you to access them much faster. This is what we need to do now, to access all the elements that are outside the limits of the function, like colliders and animations. Let's start by storing the references to the collider structure and collision points. Then a reference to the animation is done playing. Then to the collision layers or groups, and more specifically to the ground and walls collision groups.
Let's make the references to the animations hold in our enemy, walk, idle, hit, and attack. Time to start coding. In the init function, which is run when the object is instanced, let's initialize the velocity of the physic object to be vector 0. In Lua, there isn't vector 0, so you need to specifically create a vector with the three axes set to 0. Then let's create a dynamic variable called movement that will hold the direction of the movement, 1 to the right, minus 1 to the left. So, in this case, by initializing it to 1, we are telling the enemy to start the game moving to the right. Finally, let's create an anime variable to hold the current animation, that we are to initialize with null, which in Lua is nil. Let's go to the update. Let's start by calculating what should be the current speed of the character, which will be defined taking into consideration its current direction and the max speed at which it can move. We will keep it in the function variable name target speed. To access the direction of the movement, that was instanced and initialized in the init function, we need to set the reference self, which means this object in particular, and then the max speed that was defined at the beginning of the code. This gives us also a good example of the difference of initializing a variable in the global code with the local statement or at the function level, the variable gets a variable within the scope of the script, without the need of using the self-reference. If defined within a function then the scope of the local will be that function. So when defining local target speed we are limiting its scope to the update function. Then, let's get the difference in speed by subtracting to the target speed the current speed of the object contained in velocity. Since we are only moving on the x-axis, we will use the x-reference, so the variable speed diff will hold positive references if the object is accelerating and negative values with it are decelerating. Let's also define a local acceleration that for the moment will only hold the gravity acceleration in the y-axis. This the check that we will do next. First thing is to check if the speed diff is different from zero which in Lua is written with a tilde and equal sign. In other programming languages like C, C++, and C Sharp it is referenced by an exclamation mark. So if the speed diff is smaller than zero, then we are decelerating and the variable acceleration will take the value of negative move acceleration. Else we are accelerating and the acceleration will be set to move acceleration. Let's close the if statements with ends. Next, let's calculate the difference of speed in the current frame, by multiplying the current acceleration with the delta time parameter. Next, we will cap the instant velocity by comparing it with the speed diff value and save the resulting value temporary variable v0. We calculate the new variation of velocity in the current frame and then, use it to compute the difference in the position over time, 
by adding the velocity difference between two frames and use it to calculate the difference of position in the same frames. We hold the result in the variable dp. Finally, we use the difference in positions to add it to the current position of the object to identify the new position where to move the object. After moving the object, we will be resetting the control variables that we will be using in the collision function and that will help us adjust the position of the object when colliding with the ground or a wall. This will avoid the object to overlap with both. So, we reset correction to vector 0 and ground contact and wall contact to false. Let's add now the script to the enemy skeleton. For this, let's go to the enemy skeleton collection. In the right pane, right click on the root collection and select the option add component file. In the new window, select the skeleton script and you will have add the script to the enemy. Save the hitting control S or command S if on Mac. Let's try to run the game. We have an error one of the collisions that we added earlier on, doesn't have a shape. It must be the wall collision group. Let's go to the main collection and check on the wall collision component. Effectively the collision shape is empty. Click on the three dotted button and select the castle tile set. Let's try to run it. Okay. It runs but the skeleton is not falling to the ground. In the console, we can see that you have some errors. It seems that associated with a couple of typos. Let's fix them. First one, on line 64, we have type self and not self. Second, in line 70, we have an underscore instead of using a point to split the object and the method. Okay, let's run the game. Not sure if you can see it, but the skeleton is pulled down by gravity. Let's run again and let's put it in slow-mo. You can see the skeleton falling and moving through the platform as we have not yet implemented the collision detection. Let's implement collision detection. The first thing that we have to do, is to define the function that we will call when receiving the message associated with the collision. We will name it handle obstacle contact. As parameters, and apart from the self-reference, we will receive the normal of the collision, and the distance between the points that have collided. In the function, we will initialize the project vector with the dot product between the normal received and the correction vector, which we are resetting on every frame to zero. The dot product returns a value that gives in an indication of the orientation of two vectors and taking as a base the project of the first vector into the second vector. So, if the vectors are pointing exactly in the same direction we will get 1, minus 1, if pointing in opposite directions, and a value between 0 and 1 for any other angle. This means that we are saving how far along the normal direction we should move the object to have a zero value. Once we know the projection, if we subtract the distance and the dot product result and multiply by the normal, we have a vector that will show us how much the two objects have overlapped and should be displaced to be only touching. And we can use it to increase the value of the correction that has to be taken into account. Next, we move the object from its current position to a new position that is a distance referenced by the value held in the variable comp. The value y of the normal is bigger than 0.7 then we can assume that there is a contact between the two objects. 
Since one of the objects is the ground and the other one is the player then we can consider that we are touching the ground. Finally, depending on how far away we are regarding the ground, we start to adjust the velocity of the object to make the object come to a stop or not. Let's go now to the function that receives the messages sent by the game engine. If the message it is equal to contact point response, then this means that we have hit another collider. Let's check which collider was interacted with. For that, let's check the message group and see if it is equal to the ground group for which hash value we have saved in the variable group obstacle. If they are equal, then we have collided with the ground and should call the function that we have just defined passing as parameters the normal and distance values received through the collision message. Let's run the game. And the skeleton is still falling through the level. We have again a couple of errors in the code, let's solve them. The first one, in line 75, instead of self we have written set. The second one, in line 82, we have a typo with correction. Let's run it again. And now the enemy skeleton is nicely standing on the ground. But, he should be walking to the right. So, there must be something wrong with the code. Let's check. Okay, in line 51, we are checking if speed diff is bigger than zero, and it should have less than. And after a couple of debugs, in line 47, we have seen that we were multiplying the target speed with the current velocity and not subtracting it. So let's correct it. Let's run the game now. And the enemy is moving forward until it passes through the walls at the end of the level and falls down. This is normal because we are not yet testing for the collisions with the walls. We will do it, not probably in the most optimized way, but the one that will be easy to understand. Since we have a function to test the collisions with the ground, let's duplicate it and modify it to deal with the collisions with the walls. Let's change the name to Honda Wall Contact. And now, what we want to deal with are horizontal collisions, so instead of checking the Y value of or normal, we will check if the X value is different from zero. If it is the case, then we will set Wall Contact to true. Since we want to turn the character on colliding with a wall, then let's change the sign of movement by multiplying it by minus 1. Now, on the message function, we need to test too if the message group of the collision is of type wall, in which case we will call the new function hand wall contact. Since we want to turn only once the direction of the movement per collision, we will also check to see if it is the first time in this collision that it was processed by checking on the value of wall contact. Let's run the game and our enemy is moving left and right as we wanted it to do. But, he is not flipping and he is not playing the walk animation. Let's implement this next.
For that, let's create a new function called update animation. In it, we will call the function set horizontal flip of the sprite library, which receives as parameters the name of the sprite in our collection in which our case is hash sprite. We can quickly check for its name in the skeleton collection and you can see that the name that we have used when adding the sprite was just sprite. The next parameter is the result of the skeleton's movement being less or bigger than zero. If we are going right, our movement will be one higher than zero, and the sprite will not be flipped. If we are going left, then our movement will be minus 1 and lesser than 0, and there so the sprite will be flipped. Let's call the update animation from the update method. Let's run the game. And now our enemy skeleton is flipping correctly on every turn. Let's add the animations. Let's check if the character is grounded and if not moving, that we can verify by checking on the velocity x. If it is the case, then we will play the idle animation. You could say, but the idle is already playing? This is because when we created the animation we set it to be the default one to default. Now, we want to be able to change between animations when specific conditions will occur. For that, we will call a function play animation, that is not yet created, that receives as a parameter the value of the anime idle variable that was set at the beginning of the code from hashing the access to the animation idle in the sprite atlas. If the velocity in x is higher than zero, then the character is moving and we should play the walk animation. Let's create now the function play animation. First check, is to see that we are not yet playing the requested animation, in which case we will exit. This is to avoid the animation being constantly reset. If it is not playing it already, then we will play the animation. As said earlier, in Lua and default every component call is performed through messages. So, when we want to play a specific animation, we need to send to the sprite component in the hierarchy of the game object, a request, which in this case will be to play an animation. Animations that are sub-elements within the sprite and that to be referenced need the hash value of the animation that we calculated and stored at the beginning of the script. Then, we set the value of the current animation to be the new animation that we are playing. Run the game and you should see your enemy walking right to left without any problems. Maybe too far of the action. We have discovered that changes to the default render script are reset every time you exit and enter the default engine. So we will have to modify the game, but for now, let's remake them directly and enable and again the orthogonal mode with a zoom of 3. Better. The character seems to be slightly sliding. This means that the speed at which it moves is higher than the animation was designed for. Let's reduce the max speed of the character to 25. Let's quickly implement the animations for our player too. Since the code was already containing all the functions as we use the reference from the default platformer tutorial, we just need to define the animations in the sprite atlas, and then initialize them at the beginning of the player script with their hash values. For that, let's open the player atlas, and let's add new animation groups for each of the animations that we have of our player character. So starting with the walk cycle, let's rename the group to walk, and set the frames per second to 12. Since this is a walk cycle, the animation is supposed to be looping so we will not modify the playback mode. Now, 
Let's add the sprites associated with the walk animation by right-clicking on the animation name and selecting the option Add Images. Select the walk sprites from the pop-up window. Replicate the previous steps for each of the animations you have for your character, don't forget to set the FPS's and the playback to the correct value. Once finished, let's go to the player script, and at the beginning of the code, look for the hash functions associated with animation, which in our case in the previous video we had set to be all idle. Replace the animations with the right names that we have just created. If you change the name of the variables, don't forget to replace them in the play animation function too. Let's reduce the max speed to a smaller value of 50. Let's run the game. And we can see that both our characters are now able to move with the walking animation and getting back to the idle when stopping. In the next episode, we will implement basic combat and damage between player and enemy and set a life level with a basic UI on the screen. We hope that you have liked this video. If it has been the case, consider subscribing, giving a like, and clicking on the notification button. If you have any questions, problems, or comments, don't hesitate in putting a comment and we will answer as fast as we could. See you in the next video game developers.